we should talk about the sphere of economic calculation. Hopefully the, let's see, if we're red. A little red. Yeah. But it should, bad. It should be all right. What's today? Uh, today is the 19th. No, the 10th. April 10th, 2019. We're on chapter 12 and 13 mm -hmm. of Human Action. The sphere of economic calculation. Yeah, what did you think? Well, it was it was like human calcul or uh, economic calculation can do a lot of things. It can't do everything, but the things that it can do, you know, it does pretty much perfectly. Like you can determine, um, you can add everything up within where appropriate, but in places where it's like, oh. Um, that building means a lot to me, you can't, you mm -hmm. can't really calculate that. Uh, but you can calculate the alternatives, like the things that can be priced in money. Like, uh, the example given in the guide was, oh, you can get this one teaching position for 350000 that'll be cushy, and then, um, you can have this other... Or they'll be stressful, and then you could have this cushy position for 150000 And you can't put a price on the cushiness, but you you can say, is it worth the 200000 difference yeah. to me? And uh, it may be. So yeah, I have kind of a, a different view of the chapters. Oh. My big takeaway was nothing's fixed. Well, and yeah. basically everything's fake because there's no fixed point on measuring things. Like, money's, n or I guess dollars aren't a fixed, it's not a yardstick. Yes. So, you know, if you're trying to protect your wealth and you live, leave a million dollars to your family, maybe 50 years down the road that million dollars isn't exactly what it was when you first had it, when you it can't be. It can't be the same. Right. Like, there's no concept of stabilization. Yeah, television in 1950, it's not the same yeah. as the television today, and measuring the price of one really doesn't even make any sense. And I just think the attitude that, like, yeah, there's no safe haven. Like you, like, you always have to have your money in the market to participate, to keep the value or increase it. There's no... There's no, like, free lunch, like, government bond or something like that. There's, like, that's, it's, there's nothing free, and I think it's, like, a good attitude to have. Like, you can't just be like, okay, I'm rich, let me cash out. You can't cash out. You just, I don't know. You always need to put your money to work. You've got something, you've got something that's changing. Mm hmm Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, well, let's get into the questions, see where the discussion leads. The character of monetary entries. Can we anticipate future prices by looking at the prices of the past? I'd say no, but we can get close. Can't yeah. anticipate exactly what the price is going to be because no one knows the future. Right. But what else are we supposed to look to except the past? Right, we can use it as information. Yeah. Why do we have to distinguish between economic calculation and its practice by businessmen planning future transactions in those computations of business facts that serve other purposes? So this one, um, so the business facts for other purposes is something like taxes. So, yeah. you know, the state has an incentive to inflate that your asset values so you pay more taxes whereas there might be another circumstance where your incentive is to take the lowest valuation of your asset um, so those aren't those business facts aren't really true I guess you can really depend more on businessmen planning future transactions because it's 
that's a more trustworthy kind of action. This is not derived from, you know, this arbitrary tax on what you should have. Yeah, but maybe arbitrary rule. Maybe he overinflates the value of uh, his his business or assets. You know, because he doesn't want to sell them. He was like, "Oh, this um, this house is worth a million dollars when it's only worth seven hundred thousand, or something." You know, and then it's I don't know what true means in that sense. The true valuation. Well, he would be engaging with another businessman who's trying to buy the property if there's a transaction. Yeah. So there wouldn't be a transaction if. He overinflated it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess not. It says, uh, as practiced by businessmen planning future transactions. So. Right. So it's the acting man trying to achieve his ends through means. Yeah. Whereas the these business facts aren't aren't that. Mm. Mm. Hmm. Mm. Hmm. They're kind of just arbitrary numbers, to be honest, based on arbitrary rules. Yep. Can outcome, uh, economic calculation expand our information about the future? This is definitely no, because I remember it. And they can't, because it's, uh, this is back to a prioristic or a priori we can't learn any new information like we can kind of measure it and have like a different form but it's not going to create anything new that we didn't already know ah uh, yeah that makes sense economic calculation like what the price of our stock is um, doesn't necessarily tell us anything about the future mm -hmm. okay The limits of economic calculation. What are the requirements for economic calculation? Well, I would think that they would need to be, there would need to be a price, some kind of a dollar value. Dollar value. Yeah, like they need to be economic, not dollar value <laughs> specifically, but they would need to be, um, and they need to be economic. It can't be, um, like, personal feelings. Oh, money. The first sentence. Uh, economic calculation can account for things that do not exchange for money. Yeah. So, the next requirement is that it can be exchanged for money. Yeah. Like, exactly, like, love. You can't buy love. Um, How can things that don't enter into the items of accountancy and calculation be evaluated and taken into consideration? Oh, well, that's kind of like the example I gave about the different um, jobs. Like, you can't take in, you can't um, account for stress can't put a price on stress, but you can see if the difference between the stressful job and the not stressful job is enough to you to to de-stress you. Yeah, to be like, okay, um, I'll take I'll take that trade. Okay. Why is it nonsensical to compute national income or national wealth? So you can compute someone's like an individual's total wealth and take their assets minus their liabilities. Um, but that's like an acting individual. Whereas that it just doesn't make sense for to do that with a country. You can't sell yeah. all of a country's things. Right, yeah. Exactly. Um, or the whole world's things. Right. Or I think they talked about like climate. Like, what's it worth for you know a 
tropical country with nice weather or something like that. Like, what's, what's that measured in wealth? Right. Prices are not measured in money, they consist in money. That was a comment. Yeah. Okay, three, the changeability of prices. And here's a comment. The popular notion about money and money prices are not derived from ideas. Formed in the past, it would be wrong to interpret them as atavistics. Remnants? I don't know how to say that word. I'm not certain the meaning of that word. Atavistic remnants. Maybe in context I can derive it means um, something wrong from the past. I'm wrong to interpret them as atavistic. I don't know. I'll, go, I'll look it up. Atavistic. Relating to or characterized by reversion to something ancient or ancestral. Okay, so why are the ideas of price stability fallacious? Why are they so popular? Price stability is fallacious because all things are always changing, including money and its uh, purchasing power. They are so popular because people want stability. It's right. <laughs> they want um, the price of the soap that you're going to buy each week to remain the same, but in reality the, the soap's quality is changing, the conditions under which the soap is produced are changing, it's, you know, competition is changing. Yeah, I think it's competition. I think people get to the point where they want to stop competing. Huh? Like with palm olive or something? No, they want, because you, you only want stability, because if you have stability, that means you can't go lower. It also means you can't go higher, but people would want to go higher. Mm. So if you don't want to go lower, that means you're happy with where you are and you want to stop competing. Okay. Oh, um, there's another reason to this question. Why are they so popular? Macy says because of governments. Because governments are always messing with the money uh, supply and, and um, pretending that they can provide yeah, and stability and prices. Yeah, they promote the idea of stability. Stability. Yeah, they're like, we can make stability in prices, but it's like, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. um, because they don't uh, serve a market. Yeah. I think this is the first chapter, really. Mises really went after the state. Yeah, maybe. He may have, he may have yeah. He may have made references in, the past, in a few different books, but yeah, he seems to be um, critical. Mm -hmm. So stabilization. Why is the concept of stabilization useless in a world of perpetual change? Is, uh, it's not a yardstick. I, that, that it keeps, uh, like, that phrase kind of sticks out to me in this chapter. Like, money's not a yard, it's not a measuring stick. Like, it, it's always moving. It's not t taking a measure, measurement stick, but like moving it all over the place. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's of no use. Why is it nonsensical to compare baskets of commodities over time in order to define index number methods? What are the obstacles in regard to technological features of the commodities? Would it be possible to realize it if there weren't these obstacles? So the problem is that, so the commodities, 
commodities are always changing on what we use. Like, the technology is always changing. Like, you know, imagine if you took, like, an index of the technology used in the 90s versus the technology used here. Yeah. Like, Way they, fewer iPods. Or right, whatever. like, a, a pager might be really <laughs> valuable in the 90s, but then you have it in your basket in uh, 2019, and it's like, it's a piece of junk. Right. Um, and people's preferences are changing, too. Yeah. So the, the use, usefulness of those commodities, the quality of those commodities are changing. Like, I, I learned recently um, people's tastes, there are, like, fashions for food, mm -hmm. and they, they change with the decades. Like, I don't know if you know about, uh, remember, Sloppy Joes were, like, a really popular thing when we were kids, <laughs> but, like, nobody serves Sloppy Joes. <laughs> no one anywhere has that on a restaurant menu. They've traded Sloppy Joes for avocados. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and they love avocados, or I've seen a lot of... Um, grilled Brussels sprouts all over the place, which I never used to see anywhere, and like, so yeah, people's tastes are changing, and they put different, it's, um, maybe that's not a perfect example, but the basket of goods, people will value differently. Also, the, the quality is different, so Brussels sprout, one Brussels sprout isn't necessarily equal to another. But that's a good point. So... So the obstacle regarding technology is that technology is always getting better. But even if like I think we could, even if technology just stopped, like the quality is still different. The changes. Well, wait a minute. What are the ob Yeah. So the obstacle the, regarding stabilization, they said, um, or rather, Mises said that. Technology may have improved sta stability of prices because there's better consistency. I could imagine a, a guy in the 1700s building a chair versus someone in a factory today and trying to pump it out of a thousand chairs of the same kind. Mm -hmm. You're going to have more reliable production. Um, so you here in America are going to be able to buy that same chair for the same price over and over again. For yeah, years. That makes sense. From Ikea or wherever. Why can't other things remain equal if the purchasing power of money changes? So if the purchasing power of money is the only thing to change in an equation, <clears throat> Presumably, that means that nothing else can remain equal because it will affect the um, decisions of the supplier. Right. Like, how many um, input units can I put into this chair now that my money is worth less or, or more? Mm -hmm. uh, resulting in a change in the price of the chair itself. Yeah, that makes sense. Does human action imply change? Why? So human action is, you know, someone aiming for a mean and doing something about it. So, and by definition, human action implies change. Yeah, I should think so. If you're trying to change something about your life. The root of the stabilization idea. What is it meant by what economic calculation requires is a monetary system whose functioning is not sabotaged by government interference? So I guess this question is really getting at how is economic calculation sabotaged? Or I guess how are monetary systems sabotaged by government interference? Well, through inflation. I mean, if, yeah. if a government is, is printing more money, 
even if they tell you about it, it's to, it's changing the economic calculation of the evaluation of your business. Or same with taxes, because you know the the tax law is always changing. So, uh, and, right, and that affects and it changes from state to state. So, you know, the the value of your good could change based on what border you you are. <laughs> based on the, the how much it's gonna ta you're gonna be taxed to sell it or so yeah I, I think it's the yeah changing of interest rates and which he didn't really get into but also I think just taxes in general what about them so they they warp the economic calculation. What are the problems of government bond? Oh wait, you were making a point. Something about uh, taxes, the structures, um, the amounts, the borders. It's yeah, it's just all arbitrary, and it, it warps. Like any interference with like the free market is gonna warp the natural like calculation or value you put on something. Like imagine like I have this great product. And then when I go to sell it, like, you have to pay taxes or someone has to pay taxes to buy it. And that, that is based on an arbitrary rule, not based on the product, not based on, like, my wants or needs or your wants or needs. So it's just warping, like, I, like it's twisting it in, a, in an unnatural way. Yeah, I often thought about this uh, with regard to smoking. So I smoked in, like, New Jersey... Mm -hmm. In the New York area, the pack of cigarettes can be like $15, but in Winston-Salem, it can be like $4. Mm -hmm. And if I were able to pocket the difference and put it towards a health plan or some sort of, like, savings for cancer treatment and invest it, <laughs> like, wow, the trade-off might even be worth it for me to enjoy smoking, do it safely, <laughs> and, and save money for the time when I need to repair the damage I did. Right. But instead, this, this economic calculation of the tax changes my behavior where I can't save the money for that at all. Right. And therefore, it's, it's all out. <clears throat> what are the problems of government bonds? So, there's... I was saying, there's, there's no free lunch. Like, you can't have your cake and eat too. Um... Like, there's no such thing as, a, like, a safe net. Well, also, the... You, um... You have to pay for the war now. Mm -hmm. you, there's no... Paying for it with the, the... The government bonds aren't really paying for it. It's the... Things that you're not producing in the economy... That you, you pay for it now. Yeah. I like when they said, so when you get a bond, you become a partner with the state. And, be, and you're basically banking on their solvency because they have the power to tax and borrow money or print money. Yeah, but it, uh, Mises also said that it was um, inevitable that all the states will default on their um, mm -hmm. loans. Right. And that kind of leads me to the question, so how is interest for government bonds financed and it's taxes of future? Yeah, taxes in the future, um, money printing, presumably, mm -hmm. can pay for the interest. Which is essentially, yeah. That's a tax as yeah. well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> And or or default like no interest is just like oh you're screwed. <clears throat> Comment: Financing a war through loans does not shift the burden to the sons and grandsons. It is merely a method of distributing the burden among the citizens. I listened to a good uh, he's lecture online where they talked about this how. Uh, some people will say that 
you know, government debt's not a big deal because we just owe it to ourselves. Yeah. Like through bonds. But that doesn't take into account that once you get the bond, there's a secondary market which buys it up and it's um, subject to those. Like, so just because uh, the, United States, the United States citizen buys a bond, like, they still could go and sell it on the open market. Yeah, the Chinese, yeah. Japanese will buy yeah. those bonds. Right. right, and so they, yeah, so that's nonsense. So we don't really owe it to ourselves. Yeah. yeah. I see what you're saying. Monetary calculation as a tool of action. This was a nice short chapter. Study questions. One. Ooh, a comment. Monetary calculation is the guiding star of action under the social system of division of labor. Monetary calculation is entirely inapplicable and useless for any consideration that, which does not look at things from the point of view of individuals. Interesting, this question again. Mm -hmm. same, yeah. same one. Can economic calculation expand our information about the future? No. Yes, the answer is still no. Yeah. Um, yes? I was just going to move on. Okay. Unless you had something. No. To uh, economic calculation and the science of human action. What is Gresham's law? I'm pretty sure it's that people will spend the worst money they have. Was that even in this? Yeah. Oh, was it? Yeah. He yeah. mentioned, he mentioned, uh, Gresham's Law, but on, only briefly. I don't recall what the context was, but I, I remember hearing it. My ears perked up. He, um, the expression that I always remember for Gresham's Law is that good money chases bad. Good? So what does that mean? I don't know, but that's the expression that I always hear. Good money chases bad. I guess. Oh, so yeah, bad money is out the door, and then now you don't have no more bad money. Good money is going after it. I guess so. Good money chases bad. What does that mean? Well, Gresham's Law, I think you had it exactly right. That if you have, like in the days when people used tobacco for money, they would use the worst, most rotting, most oldest tobacco first, because they're like, here, I'll get rid of this, yeah, and keep the good stuff for myself. So when people are like, oh, <clears throat> um, will you take cash credit or Bitcoin? People are like, uh, I'll give you my credit card, because that's the worst money, <clears throat> and I'll keep the Bitcoins for myself. Right. I'm like, oh, uh, what is quantity theory? Quantity theory, I don't recall that. Yeah, I don't really remember this. Quantity theory. Oh, how unsatisfying. We have to end the study with a question we don't know the answer to. Yeah. I don't know the answer to what is quantity. I'll just look it up. Quantity theory. The hypothesis that changes in prices correspond to changes in the monetary supply. The hypothesis that changes in prices correspond to changes in the monetary supply. In monetary economics, the quantity theory of money states that the general price level of goods and services is directly proportional to the amount of money in circulation or money supply. 
The theory was challenged by Keynesian economics, but updated and reinvigorated by the monetarist school of economics. Sounds like, um, it sounds wrong. Because, um, the prices of goods can change independently of the amount of money in circulation. Yeah. I mean, presumably, if the amount of money in circulation stayed the same, that doesn't imply that prices would stay the same. That's what I was thinking. Quantity theory. It's crap. Okay. Chapter 14. Yeah, I was just looking ahead now. We're getting to serious chapters. The scope of catalytic problems. Catalytic? Yeah, I don't know what that means. Catalactic. But then the title of the next three chapters are the market, and then the price, and then prices, and then indirect exchange. Oh, good. It's getting real. Yeah. Catalactics or economics of the market society. It's a theory of the way the free market system reaches exchange ratios and prices. It aims to analyze all actions based on monetary calculation and trace the formation of prices back to the point where an agent makes his or her choices. It explains prices as they are rather than as they should be. That is interesting. I can't wait to read this one. So we're going to take this one at a time. Oh, this yeah, is they're, pretty, they're super long. Yeah, pretty big chapters. <laughs> I'm just looking at all the chapters. Like, they're pretty sweet. All the, the, the titles. In part four. Markets. Pretty much, like, onward. Currency and credit manipulation. Yeah, these, these look great. Okay.